before before I get started in the main uh, the main content of my speech, I, I wanted to thank you guys for being here and and also to I, I I wanted to express my gratitude for the community that that Sunlight brings together. I feel like this is my favorite conference. I come here all every year. And I love talking to the makers and the doers. You guys are the people who are up at 9.30 in the morning in Virginia. Uh, you know, you've got some coffee, and, but you're also the people who have, you've been up to your elbows in dirty data. You understand like, what it is to actually make things, what it is to try and create something new. And I really appreciate that about this community um, and, and what you're able to do together. Um, so also while I'm, I'm thinking people, you know, you really have to thank the Transparency Camp uh, folks who put this all together. We're, I say this with love, we're, we're a crotchety crowd sometimes, we're a little grumpy, we're hard to put up with, and, and they do a really amazing job at, at getting us up and, and excited about, about the morning. So thank you guys uh, for putting this together. And finally, um, a thank you to Ellen Miller. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard that this is her last year at Sunlight. Uh, she's retiring and passing the baton on to a new executive director. Um, she's been a real leader and inspiration to the space. And um, throughout her career, she saw how early, she was early, she saw how data and the internet and technology was going to transform the way that democracy worked and make it more representative of the interests of the people. And she's really worked tirelessly uh, her whole career to see that happen. Um, you know, now's not the time for a long, uh, a long speech about everything, but I couldn't, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to say thank you. So thanks to Ellen for everything. And with that, a little bit about me. So those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Anthea Watson-Strong. Uh, I work with a really talented team of engineers, a lot of whom are here today, uh, on the civic innovation team at Google. Um, and my primary job at Google is to um, acquire, uh, QA, and ingest civic data that powers products here at the Google. It gets surfaced within Google, but then also gets returned to the developer ecosystem in the civic information API. And I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've learned today uh, or the, over the past couple of years about civic data and, and maybe talk a little bit about what I see coming and some of the central challenges uh, that we face in the space. Uh, so this is a slide, Mary Meeker. Um, do, does it, who knows Mary Meeker, Meeker stuff, right? If you, if you don't get it, if you can, you should take a look at her report. Every year, she's, um, she's a VC out in, in San Francisco, and every year she puts together this internet trends report that really talks about sort of how um, the internet is growing from a, um, from a market perspective. Um, and I find this thing fascinating. It comes out every year, and I can spend a long time looking at it. Um, and we really are in the middle of the a really interesting point in, in the PC revolution. So, you know, we started in 1980, um, and for a long time, people were using desktop PCs. And then over time, we moved to using laptops. Um, and, and it's really just about seven years ago that we've seen an explosion of smartphones and devices and, and tablets. Um, and we're, we're seeing more and more people get on the internet. Uh, consumers are adopting these tools uh, at an amazing pace because they really have a profound ability to change our day-to-day -day lives. Um, one of my favorite ways to uh, illustrate this for this point, so this is um, Jean Paul, uh, or Pope John Paul II's, his funeral. Um, and then just a few years later, in 2013, there's this one, right? And so you can see over, uh, between six, seven years, it, it, the, the change that we've had. I mean, I love this one. See the guy in the bottom right? He's sort of an early adopter. He's got the, the, um, the cell phone, the flip phone out. Like, he's like, I'm into this, right? And then... And then, and then this is where we are later, right? It's kind of amazing. Um, you know, during one lifetime, we've seen uh, just a small elite group of people have access to information, um, and now everyone in the world has access to all of the information. Um, that has huge implications. And as the access to the internet increases, we're seeing the way we interact with all sorts of verticals change. Uh, so we order taxis differently, we bank differently, we book hotels differently, and yet the way we interact with government is still unchanged, for the most part. 
And I'm not the first person to make this point. It feels like every civic technology event we go to these days, that's one of the central questions that we have. So what, why, hasn't, why haven't we seen this particular vertical change in the way that we've seen the others? Um, and I know lots of other smart people in this room have thoughts about that, um, but I was going to take a stab at trying to explain it uh, from my perspective. So Ethan Zuckerman last year gave a talk, The Crisis in Civics, um, that really profoundly impacted the way that I think about civic engagement product design. Um, and, and if you haven't, uh, he, he has on his blog uh, the, the whole talk, and you should, you should watch it. It's really interesting. Um, so Ethan wanted to create a way to talk about the different kinds of social movements that were being created, and he wanted to talk about it in a way that was more nuanced. And so he created this, hmm. He created these, uh, <laughs> somebody doesn't like my slides. Uh, so he created this matrix. And so what, what you would be able to see if it, if it had poured it over, right, is the, the vertical axis is thin to thick. Um, and then the horizontal axis is symbolic to impactful. Um, so a thin action would be something that's really easy to do. And a thick action would be something that's really hard to do. Symbolic action is something that is primarily about expressing um, an op opinion about a cause or identifying with a cause. Uh, impactful action would be something that's very tied to creating real world legislative change. Um, and so one of the ways to think about this is so up in the left quadrant, we've got um, uh, what sometimes is referred to as clicktivism. I, I don't at all uh, agree with a lot of the critiques of that um, of, of, of the way that people use that word, but, um, but, but that's sort of where this is, right? So in the run-up to the Supreme Court hearings, 10 million people changed their Facebook profile uh, from uh, their original pictures to this, uh, but nobody really thought that the Supreme Court was going to take account of who had changed their profile pictures before they decided which way to go on, on, on marriage equality, right? They, they understood that this was about saying something, standing up and saying something, not about influencing the Supreme Court decision. Um, in the bottom quadrant, you've got Occupy Wall Street. I mean, that, that was a movement that was, that was very hard to do, right? Go and camp out in a square. Uh, but it, they opted out of the legislative process in a lot of ways, right? They weren't actually, they didn't have a call to action that was uh, directly tied to any sort of legislative change. I realize they were distributed, and there's, there's complications with making that kind of statement, but for the most part. Um, in the bottom right, we've got uh, some... Uh, impactful action that is really hard, and I think you know the, the civil rights movement really demonstrates this, right? We've got 20, 30 years of of planned out strategic movement towards legislative change, um, and and it was very, very difficult. <laughs> uh, and I think that probably epitomizes the most um, impactful and thickest uh, uh, action of our time. And then, so in the top right, uh, Ethan had voting. He said that that was thin, it was easy to do, and it was and it was impactful action. And I, I agree it's impactful, and I just want to quibble a little bit in whether it's very thin. Um, so just to digress a little bit, um, on April 1st, we had a DC mayoral primary, and I was really excited about voting. Um, I, I'm a new citizen, some of you guys might not know that, and, and my job means that I don't get to go to the polls much. And I was, I would just, I was excited about going to vote in, in a polling place, right? And it, the irony is not lost on me that I went to the wrong polling place. I, I product managed Google's voting information tool, and I didn't use it before I left, and so I ended up in the wrong place. And this is like 6.30, and the election ends at 7, and you need to be in line by 7 o'clock, right? So I'm racing across town trying to get to the right polling place. The point I'm trying to make is it's, it's going back to the matrix, it's, it's hard to vote. You have to register. You have to figure out, you know, do I need an ID? You need to, you need to research. It's a lot of hard, it's like hard work to figure out who I'm going to vote for and be well educated on those issues, right? And yet this is, the, this is the thing, really, that is the thinnest action that we have that is, both impact, uh, that is also impactful, right? Um, and so we're left with this opportunity. Um, you know, in the offline world, I definitely think it would be very hard to coach our neighbor and our community to uh, figure out how to, by mail, influence and comment on federal regulatory structure, right? Like, that's a really hard thing to do. But the internet actually could p potentially give us the ability to um, encourage people to take those kind of, of actions in, that, are, that are easy to take, but also impactful. And so we need to figure out how we're going to connect our users um, and take 
uh, advantage of these opportunities? How do we connect our users with the information they need to take advantage of what the internet can do? Um, at Google, one of the biggest barriers we have to launching new civic tools is really the availability of data. Um, everyone in this room knows and understands how complicated the civic data ecosystem can be and how um, hard it is to acquire even the smallest set of, of data. Um, if we're going to build the next generation of tools, we're really going to need to uh, figure out how to piece together the civic data layer that can power those kinds of products. Um, so as a team, the civic innovation team, one of our goals is to provide you, the civic developer ecosystem, the tools and the data that you need um, to build that next generation of civic engagement tools. And we do that by uh, identifying high value uh, data sets and then making them available through bulk um, and then also making them available through the civic information API. And this is what we have now um, as, as information that we make available. And part of my job is to ensure that we have this data um, in the short term, so uh, we get it by hook or by crook sometimes. Um, but I'm also interested in building out systems that will ensure that we have this data in an accurate way um, and ensuring that the cost of acquiring it trends towards zero, not just for us, but for everyone. Um, there's a couple of things I'm really excited about in this space right now. Um, one is a project that Sunlight launched last year um, and Google has been helping out with um, as much as we can, which is the Open Civic Data Project. And what they're doing is they're, well, there's a lot that they're doing. I'm just going to talk about, within that umbrella, the division identifiers. So um, not everybody agrees in the U.S. on what electoral districts should be called. So we agree on congressional districts, right? Like, what, you know, in Wisconsin, it's congressional district one, two, three, four, five. But when you get down to the local level, everybody disagrees. Um, so even within, like, city government, they can disagree. The election official can call it something different from what the city council will call it, which is something different. And it's just a mess, right? And what ends up happening um, is you end up with, so this is, this is the polling places for Dale County, Alabama. Um, they, were, they were faxed to us in 2012. And my favorite part of this doc is where they have crossed out 2006 and just written 2012 on top, right? Like, this is a great joke for this room because you guys are the ones who get it, right? You really understand my pain when I when I when I throw this up on on, on the on the on the screen. Um, but also, you know, if you look at the, what they're calling their precincts, it, that was not at all what I was looking at when I was trying to figure out how do I match the, where the polling place is to the political geography that votes at that location. Um, so a somewhat predictable. I'm not saying it's possible to create a set of rules that would standardize electoral districts of the entire country without any edge cases, but a somewhat predictable system ensures that we're able to join two different data sets on one column really, really easily. That reduces the amount of work that we have to put into building out the data sets, makes it easier for us and, and more, less costly for us, but it also makes it easier for you. There's some kinds of data that we're not necessarily going to join, but you might be really interested in joining. So campaign finance might be one, right? You want to join finance data to candidates. You might want to join, um, th th there's just an unending possibilities, all of which can then support new civic functionality um, in, in the tools. Um, another project, I, I can't, I can't get up here without mentioning the Voting Information Project, which is working really to reduce the cost of acquiring data by um, it, working with election officials, to uh, the, the people who own the data to publish it, right? This data is collected um, and, and stored for election purposes. How do we make sure that that information is published and you, in a way that is useful for technologists to use to power other tools? Um, one of the things I think is most interesting, I used to work on the Voting Information Project before I moved over to Google, and so I'm really familiar with this project. And one of the things I think is most interesting is the way that I've changed I've started thinking about the Voting Information Project differently because the political geography that they collect, so the street segments that tie to a polling place, is the same data that's needed to support who represents me. It's the same data that needs to, anything, that, anything about jurisdiction, right, starts with an election official. And so something I, I had always thought about the project and how do I connect a user with their polling place, and it turns out that that information is much more useful in a lot of different contexts, but I had just never thought about it that way. Um, and I, I see this happening all over our ecosystem at this point, right? Um, you know, in a lot of ways we're siloed, and there are lots of really good reasons why we end up siloed. Funders are a really important one, right? So, um, you know, when, you're, when your funder really cares about election administration, um, it, 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 they, they don't necessarily think an, or prioritize work that would make that same information, that same data, useful to a campaign finance group, right? Um, 
and and so um, and you know a, a lot of us are nonprofits, and a lot of us end up um, responding to the incentives that the funders provide us, and that's totally understandable and fine. But I think that we really need to fight that impulse. Um, wow, some of my slides really did not succe <laughs> successfully port. Um, so these are the kind, so th these are general groups that I think people out, out there in the audience are, um, might potentially be collecting data about that really should be talking to each other and making sure when you're publishing data, the question shouldn't just be, am I putting it out in a format that's going to work? Is it, do I have the coverage I need? Is it accurate? But it also should be, and how do I join this to everything else? Uh, how do we build this into the data layer? Um, you know, lots of people are already thinking about this in really smart ways and who are sitting out there in the audience right now. Um, I really hesitated to call out individual organizations because in some ways, if you are here at Transparency Camp right now, you're part of this fight. Um, but these are the folks that I couldn't do my work with, without. And, and so uh, I really wanted to make sure that I, I gave a special shout out, especially to Pew, um, the charitable trusts who um, started the Voting Information Project back in 2008 and have really been incredibly supportive of that um, moving forward. Um, Xavia and NOI um, have been really helpful with the open civic data identifiers. Um, and Granicus, Open North, and my society have been leaders in their own right in pushing standards and trying to figure out how do you fix this um, interoperability point. Um, and then my last point is just, again, a thank you. If you've ever been up at midnight cleaning a, a spreadsheet, if you've ever written a really terrible scraper, if you've ever um, you know, responded to someone who was like, help, I need this for my product. Um, you know, I know all of you guys out there um, in this room are doing that kind of work. And you know, it's not glamorous. And, and nobody really ever writes newspaper articles about it. But it's so important. And it really is going to, that's what's going to power the next generation, the, the exciting work um, that can happen uh, in, in technology. So um, stick to it. If uh, there's anything I can do to help or my team can help, please let us know. If there's something, if there's a data set you wish we would tackle, if there's, you know, if there's a, a research project that, that you would like help with, you know, we are here to make you guys more successful. So um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, and thank you again for Sunlight for having me.